Hello everyone, uh, Stepan here. Today I'm starting a new series uh, and the series will be on the King's Gambit. This will be an introductory video where I will cover all the basics of the opening. I will also go through all the main variations, but each variation will be, will be covered in detail in a separate video. So the series will be 10 videos and we are going to go over uh, all, the, all the main variations for white and for black. So the King's Gambit, uh, we are going back to the romantic era of chess after having covered uh, several mainline openings which are commonly played on the highest level. Uh, the King's Gambit is, you could argue, an unsound, an unsound opening. According to the engines, it doesn't have, give white uh, as big of an advantage as, uh, let's say, Roy the Royal Lopez or the Italian uh, would give. So let's get into the opening. Pawn to e4. Pawn to e5, the normal response uh, by black, preventing a central expansion by, by white. The main aim of the move e5, same as of the move c5, which is the Sicilian defense, is to prevent the easy d4 for white. And if white manages to get the move d4 in, if you imagine these two pawns being in the center, then white is going to have a comfortable central uh, spatial advantage and a lot of control in the center, controlling all the key squares. And black wants to prevent that. That's why black plays e5. Now in normal openings, the most common move is knight to f3. And the point of the move knight to f3 is to put pressure on the e5 pawn and try to put pressure on the center later on. For example, weaken the d4 square later on and then be able to push through with d4. If black does nothing, white can capture the pawn and continue that way. The king's gambit has a much more straightforward approach. The king's gambit simply forces away the e5 pawn with pawn to e4, with pawn to f4. And uh, with this move, you're accepting a lot of disadvantages, you're accepting, uh, you're accepting a lot of weaknesses, especially uh, on the king side, especially on this key diagonal towards your king, and you are giving black an opportunity to create an attack himself, but as Neil MacDonald has put it uh, wonderfully in his in his book on the King's Gambit, uh, white is pushing away uh, the black, white is forcing away the black e5 pawn, preparing to overrun the center and slay the black pieces in their beds. And that's poetically said, but it's basically what the opening is about. You are preparing to gain central control. Uh, while accepti accepting a pawn gambit, and if you if you can imagine white having uh, these two pawns in the center and all of his pieces opened, the bishops opened and the queen opened, then white indeed does have an opportunity to, to create a swift attack. Now the problem is that this idea of, of attacking chess and romantic chess did work in the 19th century when the opening was first developed, let's say. It has been played in the Renaissance as well, but the 19th century is basically when the beginnings of the theory were developed. And it did work back then because the analytical approach to chess openings wasn't uh, there yet. Nobody really uh, studied the theory that much except, except for maybe the greats such as Paul Morphy or, or somebody else. And uh, this opening, the King's Gambit, has been revived, let's say, in the 20th century. And there have been several books written in the 20th century. For example, Viktor Korchner wrote one on the King's Gambit. And the theory has definitely improved and developed. So it's no longer an opening in which white risks everything in order to gain a quick win. Black uh, has ways to defend. White has ways to equalize regardless of his uh, opening uh, sacrifice, opening gambit, opening risky play. So the main idea of the opening for white is to get rid of black's central pawn to be able to gain uh, a huge center. So uh, the main response, of course, e takes f4, immediately give white, gives white the option to play d4. Now, this isn't such a good move because of several reasons. We will get to that. The main move is knight to f3. But the, the, the goal has been accomplished. You have removed the, the defender and you are now free to expand in the center. And for black... When black accepts the gambit, uh, black has to either try and hold on to the pawn or get an advantage with an attack. So, okay, there are two options for black. Uh, black can either, after pawn to f4, accept or decline the sacrifice. That is where the opening branches out. E takes f4 is king's gambit accepted. We are going to go uh, over the king's gambit accepted in seven videos. And two other options. Let me get to this position. Sorry, whoever is challenging me uh, for declining your challenges, I'm playing right now. So 
you can understand. And after f4, two other options are d5, the Falkbeer counter gambit, which also has a very cool name, uh, which either goes into this position, ed5, ef4, which is now the modern transfer, the modern treatment of the Falkbeer counter gambit, or after e takes d5 for black to play c6, which is the Nimtsovich counter, counter gambit. Two very exciting openings. Once again, we are going to go over uh, them in separate videos. And the second option to decline uh, the king's gambit is to play bishop to c5, which is the classical variation, which is, you could argue, the soundest one for black, the safest one, and the least risky option. But it's not as active. You're not accepting the sacrifice. And in the Romantic era, this is just this would be frowned upon. Today, it's okay. But let's go over the king's gambit accepted. This is uh, the main reason why black is fine in the opening. You have to accept the gambit. White has two moves. Uh, let's go over one sideline first. Uh, the second most popular move is bishop to c4, which is the bishop's gambit. Now, uh, one disadvantage of the move is clear immediately, the fact that you're accepting a queen check on h4, and you basically have to... Uh, be aware that your king is going to be stuck on f1 for the rest of the game. Black has three moves here. Black can either play knight to f6, not using the check immediately, after which knight c3, c6, and the position is sort of normal. White is a pawn down. Black is going to expand with d5, but white has definite compensation. You can already see that white has compensation. White has two developed pieces, and white is perhaps going to be able to play d4 or d3 and open up his other bishop and then attack f4. Uh, the second option for black after bishop to c4 is the move d5, putting pressure on the bishop uh, immediately. And after bishop takes d5, queen to h4, check king to f1, you can see what I was talking about. In this position, black has given the pawn back, but the white king is never able to castle, and black is, as in every king's gambit position, slightly, slightly better. And the third option after the bishop's gambit is the move queen to h4 check immediately after king to f1 to play d6, not giving the pawn back, and after knight to f3 moving your queen, and once again black is slightly better, in this position he hasn't even given, given back the pawn, but after the queen moves, then white is going to be able to play d4, achieving his great center and putting pressure on the f4 pawn. So the bishop's opening is, uh, the bishop's gambit is definitely one of the two best moves. I would argue that it's even more comfortable to play the knight to f3 uh, on move 3 for white. And in, in fact, Bobby Fischer, when he played, and he rarely did, when he played the king's gambit, he almost exclusively employed the bishop to c4 line. And the main move after the king's gambit and the accepted accepted king's gambit e takes f4 is the move knight to f3. Now this is the uh, the main reason why the opening was uh, invented, I would say. You have given up a pawn. Black has captured on f4, but you have prevent prevented black's main threat uh, of queen to h4 check, and you are going to push through with d4 at some point. And uh, now what black has to do is he has to decide whether he wants to hold on to the pawn uh, at all costs or if he wants to create an attack. And black has several options. Uh, the move g5 is the is considered the main line in, in this variation, which is called the king's knight uh, gambit. And g5 is simply uh, defending the pawn and uh, trying to push uh, push away the, the f3 knight with g4 later on. And main variations branch out of the move g5. We are going to go over this move in one or maybe even two videos because there are uh, five... Uh, five very important gambit lines which arise from that and one more which is sort of a sideline those are the Kisertsky gambit which is one of the main line main lines the Algar gambit the Philidor gambit the Heinstein gambit and several others so there's going to be a lot of theory in this line and as i said g5 is considered the main line and g5 g5 is the best way for for black to play let me show you just one sample continuation the main move here for white is h4 challenging the g5 pawn this uh, might um, might uh, look like the semi-slav in reverse when where white uh, where black in some positions pushes uh, a5 
to weaken uh, the control of c5. So this is a common plan. And after h4, uh, black continues with g4. And here, white can either play knight to a5 or knight to, g knight, to, knight to e5 or knight to g5. These are some sample continuations. This, for example, is the Algaier Gambit. And we are going to uh, go through this opening in a separate video in great detail. This is one of the best variations for black to play. There are several other options. After the move g5, White doesn't have to continue with h4. White can continue with the move bishop to c4. And here, uh, black has two options. One of them is bishop to g7, which is the soundest one. And here, white could either continue with h4, uh, which is the Philidor gambit, or after bishop to g7, white could play castles, which is the Heinstein gambit. Both are very comfortable positions for both sides, and both lead to very exciting games. Another option after bishop to c4 is that black doesn't have to play bishop to g7, which is the safest move. Black can play the move g4. And now uh, you have uh, probably the most exciting positions in all of chess, because white can either play it safely, safely still it looks very risky castles is the main move believe it or not gf3 black gives up a piece queen takes f3 this is called the muzio gambit we are going to go to go over this in great detail so this is one line another line after g4 is that white could immediately uh sacrifice a piece with bishop takes f7 and after king takes f7 knight to uh, knight to e5 check and the main move is here if black doesn't go here, then he could be in a lot of trouble. Let's say this position here, white could even give up a knight this way. And black could be fine in some positions if he manages to get a draw, transferring his king from a6 to b6. But a lot of risky lines could arise, uh, could arise from this, from the bishop to c4 line. So after g5, white has uh, an array of moves to choose from. Uh, bishop to c4 and, uh, and h4 aren't the only two moves. Another great uh, way to play is d4, which is the Rosentretter gambit. A very risky line for white, but if black doesn't know what he's doing, then he could lose very soon. Another line after g5 is the move knight to c3, uh, the Quaid gambit. So the move g5 is the main line for black. And uh, white, if he knows what he is doing, then I believe that up to some point of maybe international master or FIDE master level, if you know all of these variations in depth, you're definitely going to have an advantage over your opponent who perhaps wasn't even prepared for you playing the King's Gambit. And perhaps this is as far as he knows the theory, that the move G5 is the main line. So if you study all of these lines, you are definitely going to have an edge over your opponent. So g5 will be covered in one or two videos in great detail. Now, um, black doesn't have to play g5. After the move uh, knight to f3, there are five more uh, defenses which are fine for black. Probably the best uh, alternative to g5 is the move d6. And this, uh, this move was popularized by Bobby Fischer, hence the name Fischer Defense. And uh, he actually introduced it is in his in his book My Sixty Memorable Games, where he wrote, wrote about the move as uh, the way to neutralize the king's gambit. He he said that uh, that d6 refutes the king's gambit. It's not true, of course, but d6 is definitely uh, one of the two best ways to fight the king's gambit. So the Fisher defense, a simple continuation, d4, white expands, using the fact that black has taken accepted the gambit, g5. Uh, defending the f4 pawn because d4 uh, expands in the center and also attacks the f4 pawn. h4, weakening g5, g4, knight to g1, bishop h6, knight to c3. You can see that these positions are very complex and if you know what you're doing, you're going to have an edge over your opponent. So this would be the Fisher defense, an alternative to g5. Another great way for black to play is the, is, is the move d5. This is the modern defense. This is perhaps the most aggressive way. And this is as if black uh, says, I'm not going to hide against you. You play the king's gambit, I'm playing even more aggressively. So the modern defense is a very aggressive way to play. e takes d5, knight to f6, bishop to c4, knight takes d5, castles. This is a simple continuation. Another way for black to play Bishop to e7, uh, the Cunningham defense. Knight to e7 can also be played. This is the bonsch osmolovsky variation. h6 is another way to play. This is the Becker defense. So black definitely has uh, a wide range of replies to the king's gambit. It's not as if white is playing a forced uh, gambit line, which black has to accept. There is only one forced variation in which white is slightly worse, but black is fine, etc. 
No, uh, this is a very complex opening. It uh, it revolves uh, around many theoretical ideas and it requires a deep positional understanding of the position. It's not only the the, risi- the risky aspects of, of the gambit for, for white or the extra pawn for black. It's much deeper than that. And if you study the, th- the theory, as black, uh, of course, you might not be able to use it as often because you can't... Uh, force your opponents to play the, the king's gambit. But as white, if you know these positions, then you are going to have uh, an amazing weapon in your repertoire because the king's gambit isn't played at the highest level as often. Uh, and that causes the lower rated player, club players such as, such as me, uh, not to play it at all. And people seem to think that uh, the king's gambit is unsound and that, that, they, that, that they shouldn't play it. The truth can't be more opposite especially against lower-rated opponents uh, up to, let's say, FIDE master level. If you know the theory in the King's Gambit, you have a great surprise weapon and you have a great edge uh, straight out of the opening. If you play the Royal Lopez, everybody's going to know that. If you play the Italian, most people are going to know the theory. If you play the King's Gambit and, let's say, your opponent plays the Fisher's defense, plays Fisher's defense, you can't tell me that they will be as prepared as in the Breyer Royal Lopez, for example. People don't play this as often, so learn this, learn every variation, and you're going to have a huge uh, weapon in your in your opening repertoire. As I said, uh, this was just an introductory video. I wanted to give you the basics of the opening. Every single one of the variations which are written uh, on the right side of the, of the screen are going to be covered in a separate video, and I'm going to go through the series in the next couple of weeks. Uh, I hope you like it. Let me know what you think. Uh, let me know if you've had any experience with the King's Gambit yourself, and... Uh, Yeah, that's it. Let me know which variation you're looking forward to the most. Uh, Thanks very much and stay tuned for more chess. Bye-bye.